Hi, my name is Jeffrey Smith with the Institute for Responsible Technology. I have two experts today and we're going to talk about a topic that you've all been wanting to hear about for years, the impact of Roundup herbicide on your mitochondria. But wait, don't hang up. Actually, it's very important. The mitochondria, if damaged, can create so many diseases. The list is so long that if you're suffering from any disease or disorder, it's probably related to your mitochondria. To talk about your mitochondria and why Roundup may be messing it up, that's the technical term, we have two experts. First is Dr. Alex Vasquez. Now, Alex has three doctoral degrees uh, from three different institutes. He's written 15 books. Uh, he's got a medical practice, and he also um, he teaches physicians all over the world. Right now, he's speaking to us from South America. has written about 100 papers. I received the last book from him. It is a textbook sized book, too intimidating for me to open, so I get the easy knowledge by interviewing him and you get the advantage of that. Welcome Alex. Thank you Jeffrey. And actually I was um, invited by Alex to speak at a seminar he was hosting uh, for functional medicine practitioners and he had the syllabi syllabuses of his three talks on mitochondria that he was giving over the weekend and they were so thick they were themselves a book. Mm -hmm. And, and I talked to people about him, and every time I mentioned Alex Vasquez, they kind of opened their eyes and said, oh my God, he's such a genius. So anyway, that's, that's how, that was my introduction to you, Alex. Thanks. And that Stephanie, puts the pressure on me. <laughs> the pressure's on, Alex. you got to perform. Right. Okay, Stephanie, uh, our audience already knows you because our interview with you last time had about 140,000 views. And everyone knows you're, an, you're a genius. You're at MIT, been there for three decades have a degree in biophysics and also um, chem, uh, computer science. You've written almost 200 papers. And what you've developed is methods to suck data off the internet and organize it so that all of this vast data that's being collected for so many things can actually be usable. And you're focusing it now on biology and most recently on glyphosate. Now glyphosate is not well known as a name, but it is the active ingredient of Roundup, which is known. And you uh, and and uh, Anthony Sansel came up with two excellent review papers linking Roundup with such a long list of diseases. Let's not take the time. We did that last time. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Pleased to be here. So, Alex, I'm going to start with you. If I have a, f a normal, healthy, functioning mitochondria, when I was in ninth grade biology, they said, oh, that's the battery of the cell. I understand that that's a bit obsolete now. Tell me, mm -hmm. what does the mitochondria do so then we realize when it's disrupted through Roundup, what can go wrong? So what, what does a healthy function of mitochondria do for us? Sure. So mitochondria actually do several different things other than what you just mentioned, which is produce uh, metabolic energy in the form of ATP. That's, that's what most of us learn in high school or even college biology. Uh, but we now know, for example, that mitochondria participate in many other processes such as inflammation and uh, even glucose and insulin homeostasis, for example. Uh, and the specific example I'll provide there is uh, when people eat high carbohydrate foods and they need to secrete insulin to lower their blood sugar levels, that the process of secreting insulin in response to glucose actually requires properly functioning mitochondria. And then for insulin to be received in peripheral tissues, that also requires properly functioning mitochondria. Therefore, just to be clear, everyone mm -hmm. knows about insulin in terms of diabetes, but insulin deals with sugar. Sure. It, it, that... it, it basically opens the door to the cells so that the sugar can enter into the cells. So, so without that, the doors are closed, the sugar freaks out and causes problems. Exactly. So then blood sugar levels get too high, and we call that you know, diabetes and or insulin resistance, which is uh, the metabolic syndrome that's so, uh, so common these days. So the mitochondria make sure the doors are unlocked? Basically, I mean, that's a good way, that's a good metaphor. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it ensures that insulin is secreted appropriately and received appropriately. Okay. And, uh, you know, relevant to diabetes, which now affects about one in three people in the United States, that's, that's an important consideration to keep in mind. Uh, All right, so if you have yeah, diabetes, then, and we'll hear it later, then your mitochondria is not happy. Uh, I think that's a reasonable thing to say these days. Uh, the data, I think, is very clear, uh, impressively clear, actually, that people who have type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hypertension, they have, uh, sorry, I lost the screen there for a moment, 
uh, they do have they do have mitochondrial dysfunction. I think the the data is very clear on that. I don't I don't think there's much debate. Uh, All right. So we mentioned we mentioned ADP ADP. For those that don't know what Krebs cycle is, that's basically the battery. It's like how do you get the energy into the cells? That's what everyone thought the mitochondria was only supposed to supposed to do. So it handles that for sure. So they sure. weren't wrong. They were just limited. They also right. missed the point that it's related to sugar metabolism through insulin uh, during door opening and closing is the technical term. Anything else that the mitochondria does that we need to know about? Well, they also control inflammatory balance within the body and also control uh, a certain type of uh, what we would call cell death, basically called apoptosis. Uh, and just to provide some uh, perspective on that, apoptosis is the way cells are normally killed or normally die off. And it's kind of a, what we might call a clean death, so to speak. Uh, and if that process gets altered so that cells don't die when they should, or if they die when they shouldn't, then obviously that would cause a problem. So, And is that example, is, is cancer an example of cells that are supposed to be mortal but have become immortal? Exactly. Uh, and you see mitochondrial dysfunction in cancer cells where they're, they're not receiving the proper message to, to go ahead and die off. And that makes them, as you just said, that makes them immortal. Um, uh -huh. and, and that's a problem at least partially caused by mitochondria. Uh, and helps connect that dot between mitochondrial dysfunction and cancer. Now, let's go back to inflammation. Uh, there was a Time Magazine cover story, which means it must be true, uh, where it was the hidden killer or the some, they, they just linked inflammation to everything, cancer, heart disease, inflammation, and you are an inflammation, what is, how do you, you're an expert in inflammation. Sure. Inflammatology? Uh, inflammology, just the study of inflammation, okay. right. All right. I mean, your your book is so huge; it's all inflammatology, um, and you've published in JAMA and you've published in Lancet and whatnot. So you're right up there at the cutting edge. Tell us, tell the lay people, what is inflammation? I mean, I think of inflammation, I think of like swollen mouths and swollen sure. tissues. Well, what's really going on, and why is it such the such the problem? Well, I, in my opinion, the easiest way to understand inflammation is just to understand it as metabolic disruption or and tissue injury. Usually those things uh, go together and kind of exist on a continuum. For example, the way I describe it is to say that inflammation exists in three different forms. One is what I call metabolic inflammation. That would be things, that would be conditions like hypertension and diabetes. And then we have allergic inflammation, that's the second type of inflammation. And then we go to autoimmune inflammation, uh, which is the topic of, of most of my work. So again, if you, if you want to understand inflammation, uh, the chronic low-level, low-grade inflammation that we're talking about right now, I would say, I would define it as metabolic disturbance with cellular injury. Now, when we talk about mitochondria then, that's limited to the metabolic with cellular injury and it does not relate to the allergies or the autoimmune disease? Sure, that's a great question. And the answer is we see metabolic uh, inflammation again kind of along a continuum. So even though I discuss these as three different types of inflammation, they're actually uh, overlapping. Uh, right. And for example, when you look at patients who have allergy or asthma or autoimmune conditions, especially lupus is a really great example, uh, they all have uh, mitochondrial dysfunction as a component of the overall picture. All right, so we're starting to give it away to people in the audience. They're starting to think, you know, they've got their list, what they have, what their friends have, mm -hmm. and whether mitochondria, whether they're going to stay with this um, video, whether it's relevant. So we're going to start, we're starting to catalog some of the problems, uh, allergies, autoimmune disease, hypertension, etc. We've talked about cancer, we've talked about diabetes. So we're starting to build sure. the list. And this I, is just basically what, it, what mitochondria does. Anything else? We've got a little category list going. Sure. Anything else I would, that is related to healthy mitochondrial function? Well, in, in terms of mitochondrial dysfunction, I would certainly add depression, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and wow. uh, autism as well. That's a lot to add. Just throw that in. Just like, I might as well add these in. That's yeah. like um, most of the population. <laughs> well, and but that's an important point. Uh, we appreciate mitochondrial dysfunction more, and I think we're also seeing more of it clinically. All right. Now, I'm interested in the mechanics of the mitochondria and how it can be De uh, related to all, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc. But we're going to do that next because what I want to do is I want to ask you, Stephanie, to describe 
what does Roundup or its active ingredient glyphosate do to mitochondrial function? Get detailed. Get geeky. Let's get into the biochemistry, <laughs> and I'll throw everyone a life preserver and figure out how to, how to translate it into English. But we also have a lot of healthcare professionals and scientists watching. And so what actually happens to the mitochondria according to the literature and the data you were able to evaluate from glyphosate? Right. Well, um, what Anthony and I are looking at now is uh, manganese, manganese deficiency. And we have hit a gold mine here. And I think it's related directly to mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, we got a clue from a study on cows uh, in Denmark that showed they looked at all these different minerals, you know, exposure to Roundup ready feed, found glyphosate in the urine, and found incredibly low levels of manganese in the blood. Across the board, all the cows ate different farms. So that was a big hint, you know, manganese. So I didn't really know what manganese did before that, but I started looking. And it, glyphosate, of course, chelates manganese. It chelates all these minerals. And I think that... Now, what, let, me, let me explain to those that what ke chelation for some people who know the term, they usually think about it as a good thing where you can get rid of heavy metals. Chelation is molecules hugging each other. So it's a love affair on the molecular level, and these chelators don't let go. So right. glyphosate is a molecule that hugs all these trace minerals called cations, and they grab them, and they don't let go. So the, the manganese is there, but it might as well not be, because exactly. it's nothing else except be in this love affair or hate affair with glyphosate. And so there may be manganese in the feed, there may be manganese in the cow, but it's not it's it's worthless it's and not getting one, into the blood yeah it's interesting that roundup ready soybeans also have low levels of manganese and on top of that the roundup chelates manganese so manganese is really um, a casualty of the roundup ready cropping system go ahead right it's it's depleted in the crops that are exposed to glyphosate and we've actually shown that in our experiments that are coming up in our new paper which we hope mm -hmm. will get published eventually so um, Manganese, so low manganese, so what that happens, what happens is manganese is crucial for manganese superoxide dismutase in the mitochondria. This is a direct hit. So the mitochondria need the manganese in order to, dis, in order to uh, break down the superoxide and turn it into hydrogen peroxide, which is a much less toxic. Um, it's a very so important. Super, superoxide dismutase, is, that, is there, can we call it SOD? SOD. Uh, it's very, very important. I'm sure that um, Alex would agree in the mitochondria to protect them from oxidative damage. So, so it can't SOD work. Is a, the SOD is a good thing in the mitochondria, but it has to be broken down to hydrogen peroxide so that it's not dangerous? It, ter it turns superoxide into something that's not as toxic. So it protects from the damage of superoxide, well, and superoxide is a major problem in the mitochondria. I if see. Don't so have SO enough. SOD protects against superoxide, so right. the superoxide dismutase is like the protector. You, you hire the hitmen to say protect us from the, from the superoxides, and it breaks it down to hydrogen, to, to hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, uh -huh. and, and then and, eventually and then water. And then it goes to water with some other things which are also interfered with by glyphosate. It involves iron, and iron is another uh, mineral that gets messed up by glyphosate. Um, I'm very interested in the iron angle lately, and I haven't got the whole story there yet, but that will be a future paper. But the right, so let, Let's say you hire the, the SOD to protect you, but for some reason the glyphosate comes in there, it, it grabs the manganese, it cripples the SOD, now you have the superoxide. What will yes. happen to the mitochondria? So aconitase is going to get attacked, and aconitase is very sensitive to superoxide. It's a critical component of the citric acid uh, citric acid cycle in the mitochondria. So when so the why, why, why do I worry about that? So then the whole the whole uh, cycle that produces the ATP is busted if the aconitase isn't working. You can't process glucose. You get diabetes. Okay. So two things you just said. We got to pull this apart. And and uh, um, Alex, chime in here, okay? Sure. We're, we're looking at a, a crippled um, uh, Krebs cycle essentially. If it's the ADP and ATP, which I know from ninth grade biology, so, so other people may know it too, who don't have advanced degrees in science, that's the energy that we use. We take in food, right. it, comes in, it becomes energy, and that base, it's based on a very specific metabolic pathway, and if that is broken down by the superoxide, challenging these things you just said, which I've already forgotten. Aconitase. Thank you. What was it? 
Aconitase, A-C-O-N-I-T-A-S-E, Aconitase. Okay. If it, so if it, if it takes that out, then there's a problem with the production of the energy. From glucose. Also a problem with insulin at the same time. So what, how does that work, either of you? Well, I guess the, the way that I would put it together is to say, uh, I would relate what Stephanie just said to another mechanism, which she, maybe she was about to uh, explore, but I'll just connect the dots. So the Krebs cycle is kind of a circular pathway, which is why it's called the Krebs cycle, cycle is in circle. And mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, passing the hot potato, we might say. Uh, these electrons go from one molecule to the next, and then it forms, again, a cycle, which is why it's called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And uh, what I'm hearing Stephanie say is that the glyphosate interferes with that cycle, uh, and that would lead to kind of a breakdown of the whole machine, basically. Uh, right. The, the second part that I would add to that, based on what I've seen in the research literature, which is usually very consistent, is to say that glyphosate, uh, in its context of Roundup, also affects the membrane surrounding the mitochondria, and that also interferes right. with ATP production. Uh, and that's the area that I've focused on in my literature reviews, uh, showing that glyphosate itself, in this context, with regard to that outer or the inner membrane, maybe isn't so bad necessarily, but it's the it's the so-called inert. Uh, solvents that are mixed in with the glyphosate right. that makes it worse and then when you combine the two together the solvents make the membrane more permeable so then the glyphosate can mm -hmm. enter and uh, I might add one more thing playing off of something that Stephanie said at the introduction of her conversation and that is she said that you know she kind of started this without even really knowing exactly what the answer was going to be she just looked at the research and I did the same thing like I don't have any I don't necessarily have any bias against glyphosate or Roundup or as a scientist or as a researcher, I just go look at the data and see what the data says. Uh, exactly. But the data is very consistent. And when the data is so consistent, then the, the question is, why is there a question about this? Uh, there's like there's no controversy in the research literature about this. It's very clear. It's very consistent. And so the fact that there's so much public debate means that people are not in contact with what the research is actually saying because the, the research is quite clear. Uh, I agree. And so I just, want, I just wanted to say that, like, I don't, I didn't, you know, I've looked into lots of different uh, topics as a researcher and as a writer and all these things. And I try to go into these topics very openly. It's like, let's just see what the research says. And, you know, how hard is it to find that research? And it, it, in my experience, having just looked at this anew about uh, 10 days ago, the research is very abundant, it's very easy to access, and it's very consistent showing that these chemicals impair mitochondrial function. So for me, the only question is why are, why are we having a public debate about this when the data is so clear? I mean, this would be, this is, this would be the equivalent, in my opinion, of like debating cigarette smoke right now. It's like it, the answer is already, uh, well known and well established according to the data. It's like why are why are people not accessing and looking at the data? I totally well, agree. Yeah. Thank you for that because um, working in the field of GMOs, um, I've been handicapped with not enough data for a long time. But it's not actually the case with Roundup. There's a lot of evidence with Roundup that implicates serious problems. To revamp or recap what you said, um, so. Stephanie, you talked about damage to the Krebs cycle directly um, that can affect the energy levels, so chronic fatigue and fatigue in general, and then also insulin problems. But then, Alex, you said it's not just where in, in the mitochondria where Stephanie is pointing, mm -hmm. on the membrane itself, right. that's where you focus your attention, there's some problems there. And you mentioned inert ingredients, and I want to share what that means for the rest of the audience who may not know. Um, Roundup has many, many ingredients in it, and the so-called active ingredient is glyphosate. And the EPA has an obsolete method of detecting or evaluating herbicides where they only look at this so-called active ingredient. But if you look at the entire formulation, as the Seralini te team did in, in uh, France, it can be a thousand times more toxic as a Roundup formulation 
than the glyphosate alone. Now, one of the aspects of Roundup is it has uh, chemical surfactants which allow the Roundup to penetrate into the cells of the plant. But that surfactant is not plant-specific. It can point, push into the cells of the plant, the cells of humans, the cells of animals. And so you were talking about how it breaks open or makes the membrane more soluble or more um, open so that the glyphosate can get in there. That's, so is that what we're... That's, ex that's exactly what I've seen represented in the research literature. All right. So is there anything else from a biochemical standpoint where we've seen from the literature that glyph how glyphosate impairs mitochondria? Before we go into the longer list of things that people may be suffering from, as a result of that, is there anything else that happens at the biochemical level uh, with glyphosate and mitochondria? I'm, I'm not um, I would add something else um, that I think is potentially going on, which is when glyphosate breaks down, uh, it breaks down into AMPA, but it also, the other breakdown product is glyoxalate. And glyoxalate is a very toxic uh, glycating ag agent, much worse than fructose, which in turn is much worse than glucose. So it's going to cause glycation damage to proteins, which is going to mess up their behavior. And now I also explain want to... What glyc explain what glycation means, please. That's, that's so, glycation is what you get from sugar when there's too much in the blood and you end up with a hemoglobin A1C. People get their hemoglobin A1C tested, and if it's high, that means they've got diabetes or, or they're tending towards diabetes. Sure. And that's, hemoglobin A1C is an example of glycated hemoglobin, which then doesn't work as well as normal hemoglobin in carrying oxygen. Sure. If, so then it, so you can, get, you can if, get oxygen deficient because of that, and it can lead to uh, very interesting problems that will cascade into reactions in the brain when there's not enough oxygen. I was just going to add one other way of, dis, of describing that is to say that glycation basically means taking a sugar and binding it onto something else. So let's say this is a sugar molecule and this is hemoglobin. If, if we bind a glucose onto that hemoglobin, it's not going to function as well. Uh, and I th that's basically what Steph Stephanie was saying. Glycation is rather nonspecific. It just means attaching a sugar onto a protein, usually. Uh, and when, when it, it kind of, it's like throwing a monkey wrench into the system. It just makes the system different and therefore usually less effective. Right, so, and it can, it can also cause, for example, LDL particles get gly glycated, and that prevents them from being taken up by the liver to get recycled. And that's how you end up with high LDL. And actually, LDL being, being a cholesterol. Cholesterol, high cholesterol, which people are all taking statin drugs for. Cholesterol is going up. Uh, high cholesterol is becoming a worse and worse problem over time. I think it's due to the glyphosate. So I use the word glycosylation in my books uh, for sugar attachment. Is there a difference between glycation and glycosylation? Not I think they're the same thing. Alex, yeah. do you agree or not? I'll, I'll go with so, that. So there was a study done in Australia that some of the listeners may be aware of where they found a supposedly harmless gene uh, was transferred from beans to peas. They produced an identical protein that was being produced in the beans that was produced in the peas, and yet the pea protein created inflammation in fi all five tests in mice, showing that that pea might actually cause allergic reactions in humans and possibly death. They couldn't figure out why it was the same amino acid structure as in the beans as in the peas. The ones in the beans did not have the inflammatory response. So they looked at the gly glycosylation patterns, the sugar molecules attached to the pea, and found that there was a subtle difference in the pattern of how the sugars attached. And they blamed this completely significant change, which can change a harmless protein into a potentially deadly one, on a subtle change in these sugars. Mm -hmm. So now what you're saying to me is, Stephanie, that one of the breakdown products of Roundup, of glyphosate, is not only AMPA, which we know is toxic, but mm -hmm. this other thing which can change the sugar attachments throughout the body, wherever it is, and that can change. We know it can create allergic reactions, but you can also say it can create diabetes and other problems. Is that right? That's what I would suspect, and I haven't, you know, I was very surprised to see that glyoxylate there because I already knew about it from methylglyoxyl. I've talked about methylglyoxyl before, which is a similar compound, also very, very... It's not something that anyone else has, has noticed as far as its uh, ability to 
uh, cause sugar damage, but I would be almost certain that it would, given chemistry. All right, we'll put a little mark next to that for follow-up research and alarm. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is aconitase, actually. So low aconitase, along with low glutathione, have been found in association with autism. You can practically completely separate in a study that I saw the autistic group from the non-autistic group on the basis of those two uh, molecules, the aconitase and the um, glutathione. Glutathione, of course, is this um, very, very important sulfur-containing uh, uh, detoxifying agent uh, in the liver and elsewhere in the body. So we talk about aconitase as being disrupted by the superoxide when, they don't have, when you've hired this guard, SOD, and he ends up messed up because of the ma manganese deficiency. The aconitase goes down. You've mentioned in the, in the discussion we had previously that the, that the sulfur problems are, can be rampant because of Roundup also, so the glutathione can also be affected, mm -hmm. and those two together are now linked to autism. Right. Are there any other mechanism, before we go into what this could mean for health, I believe even, even more so, and, and just list them out, and we've got some other things we want to add to it, is there anything else, Alex or Stephanie, that you know about where glyphosate or the Roundup formulation assaults the mitochondria and its effects? Um, I would probably say glutamate. Um, so glutamate, excess glutamate in the blood and in the brain are associated with autism, also with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Glutamate is a neurotoxin at, in, when it's excessive. It's actually a neurotransmitter, but it, uh, the brain usually manages it very carefully, puts it into the synapse, and then these astrocytes take it up, convert it to glutamine, and then the glutamine gets shipped back to the, to the neurons, and they convert it to glutamate in a sort of safe compartment. So they're being very careful not to have glutamate hanging around outside of the synapse. But what happens is that glutamate can't be converted to glutamine if you don't have manganese. So again, the, 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 the enzyme that converts glutamate to glutamine, takes in ammonia and glutamate and turns it into glutamine, is manganese dependent. So that's another component, I think, of toxicity because the glutamate could then do damage to the cell, probably to the mitochondria. Alex might know that specifically. Alex, is there any relationship to the mitochondria in this scenario? <laughs> There, I would I would call it an indirect relationship, uh, and maybe a bit more complicated than we, we might want to get into uh, in this conversation. But if okay, if I'm, <laughs> but I might, glutamate is definitely a neurotoxin for sure. You wouldn't right. deny for that. Sure. Oh, yeah. every, everybody know, and you you explained it exactly correctly. In in what we might call physiologic norms, it's a neurotransmitter, but it, be, it it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. So if, if we have too much glutamate, then it's neurotoxic and actually kills brain cells, and that's why some kids have seizures because of too much glutamate. Um, I just wanted to add... There's a lot of people. I'm sorry? Go ahead. I was just going to add one Go more ahead. thing. Uh, since the, the two of you have both talked about the glycosylation reaction where we attach a glucose or, or other molecule onto a protein, uh, that, don't, that not only causes uh, what we might call uh, molecular uh, dysfunction because then those proteins can't function properly, but it also does cause inflammation because the body has a receptor for those damaged molecules. Mm -hmm. uh, we call those molecules in general, we call them advanced glycation end products or AGE, and they have a receptor mm -hmm. called RAGE, RAGE, uh, which is the receptor for advanced glycation end products, and that actually triggers more inflammation as well. So anytime you see that glycosylation reaction happening, you would expect to see some type of metabolic impairment and inflammation, uh, and again, in my model, those go hand in hand. It's interesting, just for those that are familiar with the literature on GMOs, um, there was a high lysine corn that Monsanto wanted to introduce to Australia, and Dr. Jack Heineman pointed out that when you have this high lysine there and you cook the corn, it Absolutely. will create these AGEs, and it can cause all sorts of things like cancer, and the regulatory agencies had completely ignored the fact that these AGEs would be more likely to be produced in the cooked GMOs compared to the natural. And they completely ignored the 100-page the submission by Heinemann and his, and his colleagues uh, and were about to allow this onto the market, but fortunately the European uh, Commission and the European Food Safety Authority asked some questions of Monsanto, then instead of answering the questions, they withdrew the application, and so we hopefully won't see that high lysine corn. Hmm. Wow. So now we have an idea of how
how glyphosate, we picked up mitochondria really because there's so much literature on glyphosate and mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, Alex, can you give us a list of the diseases and disorders that you see in your practice or on the rise in the, in, around the world or anywhere which you think may be related to mitochondrial dysfunction and thereby might be related to the vast use of Roundup and other glyphosate-based herbicides. Sure. So I'll, I'll separate that into two different uh, responses based, and, and the reason I'm doing that is just to be really clean with what the research says uh, and, yeah. and the, the way that I interpret that research. Um, so your, the first part of your question was, what conditions do we see clinically associated with uh, mitochondrial impairment or mitochondrial dysfunction and you know not to sound cliche about it but it's it's pretty much everything that you see uh, depress so from neuro neurologic conditions like we already mentioned Alzheimer's Parkinson's autism uh, to inflammatory conditions like hypertension diabetes uh, to allergic conditions like asthma and allergy uh, like uh, atopic well Allergic rhinitis is, is one of the things I was thinking of. Just any type of allergic condition. When the, when the mitochondria become dysfunctional, they just start to send off alarm signals, and those alarm signals you know, result in this nonspecific response that we call inflammation. And then, again, my personal interest, which is more of the autoimmune conditions like lupus, uh, those patients definitely have uh, a form of uh, mitochondrial impairment. So if we were to make a list, again, of the conditions associated with mitochondrial impairment. It's a very long list. It's, it's things that doctors see every day in their practices. And then the question becomes, which is what you just asked, or the second part to your question was, what role would glyphosate and or the uh, associated so-called inert chemicals, which uh, they shouldn't be called inert chemicals anymore. They should just be called mm -hmm. solvents or something like that. But inert's just, it's not, it's not physiologically appropriate based on what we know uh, according to the research. Uh, and the other thing I would say, and I realize that the, this conversation is around glyphosate, but I also don't want to also say that it's only glyphosate or only Roundup causing these problems. It's, in, in the research literature, these are referred to as persistent organic pollutants, and it's a very broad category. Uh, but the paradox of that is that it actually makes it worse than, than looking at one set of data, because we're talking about a human population, a global population that's literally polluted with multiple chemicals. It's not just glyphosate, it's not just the inerts and the solvents. You're also talking about other herbicides, other pesticides, other flame retardants, other industrial chemicals, rocket propellants and things like that, mercury. You're, you're mixing all of that into you know, our, our human species, our human existence these days. And, it can't help but have an additive or synergistic uh, negative effect. So, uh, you know, just to just to be clear, sure, we can talk about in this context the the impact of glyphosate, which I think is uh, it's a legitimate concern, uh, but it's not the only concern. I mean, our mitochondria are being poisoned left and right, basically, uh, and this is just one piece of that puzzle. Now, that is a perfect segue to the next point, and that is exactly how glyphosate can be synergistic with these other toxins. So uh, Stephanie, can you talk about your paper, your first paper on glyphosate with, with uh, Anthony Samsel, was looking at how glyphosate blocks the cytochrome P450 metabolic pathway. Right. That's a lot to say, but can you explain how that how that action of glyphosate might increase the negative impacts of many, possibly all of these other toxins that Alex just mentioned. Yes, well the thing is that these, these are called CYP enzymes, CYP for short, and um, there's many of them in the, in the liver, and they are incredibly important for detoxifying many, many different environmental toxins, including medicines that you take, and um, they're also important for ac activating vitamin D. So we have a vitamin D deficiency these days, and I think it may be in part because glyphosate is preventing the liver from activating it. And, but when you can't detoxify all these other toxic chemicals, they become much more toxic to you than they would otherwise be. So there's a synergistic effect, just as Alex said, uh, between glyphosate and the other 
um, toxic chemicals. I've particularly looked at aluminum lately, and I'm quite worried about glyphosate working together with aluminum, um, again, because it can chelate metals. So glyphosate acts a lot like citrate, I believe, in forming uh, a small uncharged molecule, molecule out of aluminum. Aluminum has a plus three charge, which makes it harder for it to get past the gut barrier. But glyphosate um, neutralizes that charge by surrounding it with these glyphosate molecules, and therefore it becomes easier for aluminum to get past the gut and into the blood and then onto the brain and things like that. So I believe that glyphosate is greatly enhancing the toxicity of aluminum. So now we have, you mentioned um, three things right there. First of all, you have all the CYP enzymes that have little shovels in the liver and they're shoveling out all of the toxins and all of a sudden the head of the shovel breaks because the CYP right. enzymes are working. And so they can work, sometimes they work overtime and they'll increase the metabolic rate of the liver and it's still not working as well. So there you have the, the detoxification pathways using the CYP enzymes which are disabled or, or problem made, uh, uh, messed up is the technical term by glyphosate uh, so that all the other things that are supposed to be shoveled out of the liver can be sticking around causing problems. That's then right. the liver doesn't create the vitamin D which is also important for overall health and defense against toxins. And finally you have glyphosate because of its chelating properties becomes a smuggler and it will smuggle right. toxins into the system that normally don't get past the defenses. So those are the ways that glyphosate acts synergistically with some of the toxins that you mentioned, Alex, so that yes, absolutely, it's not just glyphosate, but in the presence of glyphosate, the other toxins may be more toxic. Anything to add before we go on to the next and uh, uh, final topic? I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable uh, and very academic conclusion to say that if something inhibits cytochrome P450, it's going to increase toxicity of everything else the patient's exposed to because they can't clear out those drugs or chemicals. So if indeed glyphosate does block that enzymatic pathway, then by definition it would lead to an accumulation of other chemicals. Right. There I should add one more thing um, okay. about the heme. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, glyphosate, I have only learned recently that glyphosate interrupts, uh, disrupts the first step in pyrrole synthesis, P-Y-R-R-O-L-E. Pyrrole is an incredibly important uh, constituent of heme, of chlorophyll, and of the corin ring in cobalamin. So I am uh, suspecting that one of the ways in which glyphosate is hurting the gut bacteria is by preventing them from producing these really important uh, molecules, the heme, the cobalamin, and, um, and also the chlorophyll, of course, in plants. And some people have argued that that may be a very important constituent of the way glyphosate kills plants beyond the original one that Monsanto likes to say, which is the shikimate pathway. So it's Never another way to kill plants. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of richness in glyphosate. Uh, when you and I were in Beijing recently, uh, Don Huber pointed out that it suppresses 271 enzymatic pathways. So you've got right. your homework to do. <laughs> I, so yeah. One of the things that that Roundup does, and this was pointed out to our attention by Dr. Don Huber, who's an expert in Roundup, used to consult for Monsanto, and is an expert at plant pathology. He pointed out that Roundup or glyphosate kills not only the beneficial gut bacteria in the soil, but promotes soil-borne pathogens. Now it promotes soil-borne pathogens in two ways. One, directly. So if you just take in a petri dish and you have Roundup, it'll promote uh, you know, certain fungal-based pathogens and they'll grow 500 percent more than if there was no glyphosate. Um, but also by killing the beneficial microorganisms, some of those organisms' job is to keep the fungal-based pathogens in check. So not only do you have a expanding uh, funguses in the soil, but the guards that are supposed to keep that low, they're dead. And so you have this explosion of soil-based pathogens in the United States. He believes over 40 plant diseases. And some of them, like Fusarium, can produce mycotoxins. And in our discussions prior to this recording, we were looking at the mitochondria and those mycotoxins. Would either mycotoxins, would either of you like to comment on how the mycotoxins promoted in the soil, ending up in our grains and foods, might also bash the mitochondria? 
I don't, I don't have any addition to that. Uh, what I've looked at in my work related to microbes is mostly how bacteria affect uh, mitochondria, but I don't have a, an additional comment related to the soil-based organisms. Okay. But I do, I do know that micro, uh, mycotoxins are incredibly toxic. They do, um, and they certainly disrupt DNA, and of course there's DNA in the mitochondria, so that could be a connection. I think right. maybe. Um, and of course, uh, many of the uh, species that are going extinct are going extinct because of fungal infections, especially uh, the U.S. has a very large number of both plant and animal species that are in trouble because of uh, fungus infection today. And I think that's directly connected to the glyphosate. Uh, uh, Howard Vlieger, who we know um, from um, China and elsewhere, he tested the air quality in a cornfield and a soy field and sent it out to a laboratory. And the laboratory came back and said, this is very dangerous air. He didn't know, they didn't know where it was taken. They said, do not expose yourself too long in this because it can have serious patients. And that's, that's where, um, you know, farmers work. And that's actually where I live in Iowa and that's what we breathe. So, mm. yeah, this is serious. All right, so let's wrap up with the good news or at least the action steps that people can take. Um, you mentioned, Alex, that there's a lot of assaults to mitochondria, so have living clean, a clean living in general, um, is a good idea. Um, let's talk about Roundup specifically. Uh, what are some ways that people can avoid exposure to Roundup, either of you? Sure. Well, you know, the first rule in environmental medicine is always avoiding exposure. So the most obvious answers that I'd start out with are, would be to say, don't use it, you know, don't use those products around the house. Uh, try to eat an organic diet, which I think should be pretty obvious. In fact, an article was just published a few months ago showing that even after just one week of an organic diet, people's pesticide levels uh, drop by about 90%. Uh, but that's pretty significant with, within just one week. And I think we could probably use that kind of as a surrogate marker for other herbicides and pesticides. Uh, they probably also drop. Uh, either faster or slower, maybe slower. So first of all, avoid exposure, whether it's through the environment or through food intake. Uh, and then with proper nutrition, promote those, support those detoxification pathways. A lot of people have nutrient deficiencies, especially magnesium. So I always recommend that people take a multivitamin. I think that would be reasonable. Uh, getting exercise. Let's do this. And let's do this. Let's sure. talk about the entire regimen of what you recommend for people to prevent or recover from it in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the avoidance just a little bit more and we'll come back to that because I know a lot of people sure. want to hear that. Okay. Uh, Stephanie, you in your last uh, published article with Anthony Samsel talked about some of the new sources of glyphosate exposure because of and the Environmental Protection Agency's um, decision to allow us to be exposed more. Can you share these other sources? Everyone knows about Roundup Pretty Crops, soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa. All of those are sprayed with Roundup. Um, the sugar beet pulp is fed to animals, including racehorses. I wouldn't do it if I had a racehorse. I so know. In addition to the genetically engineered Roundup soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa, talk about the exposure through spraying Roundup and other crops. I know. I was actually really stunned when I read this, but it's becoming an increasingly popular um, um, strategy to spray certain crops with Roundup just a few days before the harvest. And these are crops that are not Roundup ready, so they die. They die when they're exposed to Roundup. But that's the intention. So the idea is to you spray the wheat, and three days later you harvest the seed. And so the spraying, what it does is it causes the plant to immediately go to seed as a kind of an acute reaction to a toxic exposure. And that synchronizes seed production and increases yield. It also, of course, causes the plant to die. So you have a much lower a residue to clear up for next year's crop. Mm -hmm. And it also gets a head start on next year's weeds. So these all seem like good ideas. And so more and more farmers are finding, oh, geez, that works out well. Increase yield, you know, save me some trouble clearing the field, get me a head start on the weeds. So more and more farmers are doing that over time. And we actually have data from uh, the US government showing that that's the case. And that the, the increased use of Roundup on wheat is going up exactly in step with celiac disease. And so I mm -hmm. think this is a direct connection because, of course, celiac disease is a wheat uh, intolerance, a gluten intolerance. And this is not just wheat, but also barley and sugar cane. And I'm not sure what all other crops, but I suspect there may be several 
and it's not well publicized and we're not, it's not easy to find out exactly which crops are being sprayed, but they do, are not Roundup ready. The intention is to kill the, plot, the, the plant. And um, I find this very, very disturbing because we're not even really measuring how much glyphosate is ending up in that seed. But I can bet money that it's there. It turns out they approved by classes of fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans. And if you just look at the number of crops within those classes, it's about 160. Um, wow. We don't know if Roundup is applied to all 160, but it's been basically given the clearance for parts per million, two parts per million, three parts per million. TEF had 200 parts per million. And the toxicity of Roundup has been noted at parts per trillion. So to put that in perspective, the level approved of residues on our food can be a million times higher than that which was found to multiply breast cancer cells in laboratories. So uh, they don't pay attention at all to the minute endocrine disruption levels, which is a horrible, a horrible oversight. I just testified before the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council Committee on Genetic Engineering, and that was one of my recommendations to take the testing of, of these herbicides and, and other toxins out of the dark ages and integrate it into what we now know as endocrine disruption dose levels as well as testing the full formulation not just the so-called active ingredient. Right. So now we've exhausted the subject and many of the people watching who are wondering, oh my god, that's the cause of my problem. I have mitochondria and it's not happy. So Alex, it's your turn. For those people who are suffering from problems related to mitochondria, you're the doctor, and I know that you're not going to give very detailed prescriptions to people this way. But generally speaking, for generalized help and support, what would you recommend? Sure. Well, uh, so I, I do have uh, a mitochondrial protocol that has probably 30 different components in it. Uh, we'll just talk about the first, which I think are the safest and, and most basic. Uh, again, going back to uh, just a healthy... Uh, a plant-based diet, but not it doesn't have to be a vegetarian diet, but just making sure that people get a lot of fruits and vegetables for antioxidants uh, and adequate protein, but a low-carbohydrate diet. Low-carbohydrate diets help improve mitochondrial function. Uh, in contrast to what we all taught, which is you have to eat glucose to make ATP, uh, if people eat too many sugars, it actually impairs their mitochondria. So low-carbohydrate uh, paleo diet or paleo-mediterranean diet is how I describe it. Uh, Low-grade exercise or just moderate exercise helps improve mitochondrial function. Uh, like I mentioned before, making sure that the nutrient uh, intake is sufficient by using a good broad-spectrum high-potency multivitamin multimineral I think is a good idea. Uh, that would compensate. Alex, before, mm -hmm. One question. You said moderate exercise. Does that mean heavy exercise is not good? Well, extreme exercise certainly increases uh, demand on mitochondria, which can ultimately stress them out and cause excess uh, oxidative damage. So, you know, we're not talking, right. it, it doesn't have to be like marathon running or, you know, any type of extreme sport, not, not that I'm against those, but uh, when we're talking about improving mitochondrial health, just moderate exercise, kind of uh, nothing too, you know, heroic or dramatic, but uh, just, you know, trying to stay fit, so to speak, uh, All right. that would, that would be adequate. And then, Beyond basic vitamin and mineral supplementation, uh, people could take certain nutrient supplements like coenzyme Q10. That's very effective for helping to protect and preserve mitochondria. Uh, a few other nutrients like N-acetylcysteine, for example, which is a uh, pre it's an amino acid, but it's a precursor to glutathione that was mentioned previously. It's an uh, antioxidant. It helps to protect the mitochondria. Uh, those would be some basic, uh, basic things, and I'll just mention one other, along with exercise. So one of the benefits we get of exercise is mobilization of fat, we get to sweat, and through that sweating, we get to detoxify some of these chemicals. So that's another advantage to exercise, not simply the aerobic benefit, but the detoxifying benefit as well. Those are some basics. Uh, again, of course, I could go on and on about that topic because I've got books and presentations on it, but I'll just say those are some reasonable things people could do. Perhaps you could set, send us the more in-depth protocols that you would like to share, if, if you would like to share them, and we can post them sure. and link to it from this uh, sure. from this. I, as you know, I just published an article on this uh, earlier this year, so I can send you that article, and you, you're, you're certainly welcome to share that. 
Great, excellent. All right, anything you want to share before we sign off? Well, uh, I would add one more thing uh, in terms of detoxifying. Uh, and I haven't seen this specific to glyphosate or its uh, associated uh, so-called inert solvents and things like that, but uh, a nutritional supplement called chlorella has been shown to help people detoxify dioxins, which are another category of toxins that we're all exposed to. Uh, that's been proven in animal studies and in two human studies. So in terms of doing something uh, perhaps a little more assertive to detoxify the chemical load that we're all exposed to, uh, including but not specific to glyphosate, I would say chlorella would be a reasonable addition as well. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Stephanie, do you want to add anything? Um, I would always like to add sunlight. I'm real, a real believer in sunlight um, exposure to the skin and to the eyes. I think that um, that, uh, that produces cholesterol sulfate, which helps you to provide sulfate to the body, which I think is a very critical uh, component of glyphosate destruction. That glyphosate messes up the sulfate, as I've talked about before. So sunlight exposure and, of course, sulfur-containing foods. All right, so everyone, go outside, do moderate exercise, have sulfur-containing, low-carbohydrate low diets while popping multivitamins and multiminerals with CoQ10 and some chlorella on the side. Okay, and uh, that's reasonable. How do I do? Oh, that's good. It's a good summary. And eat, eat organic. Right. If you didn't say that. Eat organic. Oh, eat yeah. organic and grow organic right. if you can. <laughs> that's my job. Okay, now I'll make a recommendation to help avoid GMOs. Um, buy, go to non-gmoshoppingguide.com or download the iPhone application Shop No GMO. But as you figured out by now, if something is non-GMO, it does not necessarily mean that it is completely free of residues from glyphosate. You can have non-GMO wheat. Wheat is not genetically engineered, not in the way that we mean by inserting genes, but it might be sprayed with Roundup and have Roundup residues. And when you're spraying Roundup just a few days before harvest, that means there's a lot of it still left in the plant. In fact, it actually migrates to the live portion of the, of the plant, which is the seed, which is harvest, which we eat. So. Buying organic will not only help detox, as Alex said, but it will also reduce your exposure. So that would be organic, low-carb uh, fruits and, you know, etc. All right, so wishing you all safe eating. Please share this video, not only with your friends, but also with your healthcare professionals, scientists, uh, well-wishers of life, geeks of all types. This is information that's necessary. We're getting, we're drilling down now into the real causative elements of why we should be eating healthy and what could go wrong. Safe eating, everyone.